The title of our thoughts today is Teach Us to Pray. And our text will be from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. You know, in the past, I have taught a series of lessons on the Apostles' Creed, which is the basic teachings of the gospel regarding uh, what we believe as Christians. Uh, I brought an extended series on the commandments of Christ, which deal with living a, a practical Christian life in the daily world. And I have also brought extended series on the uh, fundamentals of salvation, the human condition and how God has dealt with that. And I've always sat, thought to myself, you know, I, I really want to preach, teach on the Lord's Prayer. And uh, it's, it's not something that, well, I suppose you could if you made it, but it could not be a series of like 12 lessons or something like that. It's just a little easier to do it uh, in one. So today we are going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer and uh, picking it apart and seeing what it has to say to us. So let's uh, read our scripture, Luke 11, starting at verse 1. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer him from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Must have been in Oklahoma, right? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. The fact that the disciples of Jesus asked him to teach them to pray suggests that real prayer is something that must be learned. In other words, it is not natural to the human condition. As sinners, we were in a state of rebellion against God and we were not interested in any kind of correspondence with him. In a sense, we were our own God, and we believed that we did not need God. Yet, at times, we may have been overcome with problems and made some kind of verbal or appeal to God, if there is a God, for help in that time of need. However sincere or insincere that may have been, it was a stab to our conscience that let us know that we were indeed not our own God, but in need of the God who is there. 
the fact that it was the disciples that asked Jesus to teach them to pray shows that we really do not comprehend prayer until we have established our relationship with God. The prayer that Jesus taught, which we call the Lord's Prayer, is recorded here in Luke's Gospel and also in Matthew chapter 5, verses, excuse me, chapter 6, verses 5 through 16. And there are some slight differences in the words of these two prayers that are explained by more than just the understanding of the two different gospel writers. Adam Clark comments, The prayer related here by Luke is not precisely the same as that mentioned by Matthew. And indeed, it is not likely that it was given at the same time. That in Matthew seems to have been given after the second Passover. And this in Luke was given probably after the third Passover, between the Feast of Tabernacles and the dedication. While Clark comments on the different points in time, Matthew Henry suggests a more practical reason for the differences in the two prayers. He wrote, Christ gave them direction, much the same as he had given them before his sermon upon the mount in Matthew 6, verse 9. We cannot think that they had forgotten it, but they ought to have had further and fuller instructions. And then Matthew says, in Matthew, he directed them to pray after this manner here. When you pray, say. And then he goes on to point, there are some differences between the Lord's Prayer in Matthew and Luke, by which it appears that it was not the design of Christ that we should be tied up to these words, for then there would have been no variation. So from what these commentators say, Jesus was not giving the disciples exact words for their prayers, but instead an outline for what constitutes real prayer. Reciting the Lord's Prayer in worship is appropriate as it reminds us of what our prayers are to be, but doing that does not replace the necessity of our personal prayers with God. So let's now look at the Lord's Prayer. It starts off, Our Father. Notice, Our Father, not My Father. In our prayers, we recognize that we are children of God and part of the collective family of God. So we pray in the spirit of unity, fellowship, and Christian love. That motivates our prayers. That encapsulates our prayers. The word Father is at the very beginning of the prayer. And it's more than just a greeting to us. It is to show our tender and respectful love for God, such as children should have for their fathers. It also shows strong confidence in God's love for each of us, such as fathers should have for their children. Then in heaven, this statement acknowledges five attributes of God. First, his omnipresence. In praying God in heaven, we recognize God is everywhere at all times. Next, it acknowledges his majesty and dominion. God, in reality, rules over everything, regardless of what be, may be going on at any moment in time. It also acknowledges his power and might. That tells us no earthly power can withstand or hold back the power of God. God can do whatever he pleases to do. It also acknowledges his omniscience. God sees and knows everything that is going on, not just on earth, but in the entire universe. Nothing is hidden from God. 
And then finally, it acknowledges his purity and holiness. God is the opposite of sin and evil. And he is the power that overcomes all that is wrong and he establishes that which is right. Then we say that God is hallowed. In saying that, we recognize him to be a being separate from and superior to the earth. Hallowed, holy above all this. And then we say, we're praying in your name. So we acknowledge him to be who he says he is, the God that is there. And we pray, your kingdom come. The kingdom has indeed come in the gospel of salvation from sin. So we are to pray that the kingdom, the gospel, will come to all who have not heard its message of redemption. And we pray, your will be done. This is really another way of saying, your kingdom come. And we ask that the righteousness of Christ, spiritual life, and joy in the Holy Spirit be experienced in the hearts of other people. And then we say, on earth, as it is in heaven, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are saying that salvation, the will of God is the result of two wills working together. One being the will of God, the other the will of man. God wills the salvation of all souls. Otherwise, they could not be saved. Amen? That's true. Yet God has given souls the right of free choice, and they cannot be saved unless they exercise their will, repent of sin, and accept God's gift of salvation. So implied in this petition is for God to empower us to live without sinning in this present world. We are asking to be led into the perfect will of God for our lives and that God will lead others into his will for their lives, the salvation of their souls. Then we are to pray. Give us day by day our daily bread. Adam Clark gives an excellent explanation for this request. He writes this, God is the author and dispenser of all temporal as well as spiritual good. We have merited no kind of good from his hand and therefore must receive it as a free gift. We must depend on him daily for support. We are not permitted to ask anything for tomorrow. Give us today. We must ask only that which is essential to our support. God having promised neither luxuries nor superfluities. I love that word superflu superfluity. People don't use it anymore. And in case you don't know what it means, it just means more than what is necessary. Superfluity. So praying for daily bread, we then ask God to forgive our sins. This, my friend, is not an admission that we have to commit sin or that we are unwittingly committing sin all the time. John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, 1, these things I write to you that you may not sin. So we understand that sin is not to be part of our lives as we live for God. Yet being creatures with free will, the possibility of committing sins is always present. And giving that possibility, John adds to his words, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. So here is a point of honesty for our prayers. If we do commit a sin, 
immediately repent and ask God's forgiveness and ask for grace to never commit such a sin again. And notice there is a contingency that Jesus adds to this. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Okay? Who, who, who are we supposed to forgive? Everyone. How many is included in everyone? About the same number as in all, right? <laughs> okay. Forgive everyone who is indebted to us. See, as much as we are indebted to the mercy and grace of God for the forgiveness of our own sins, we are called to forgive those who offend us. Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. As recipients of mercy, God requires we show mercy to others. Otherwise, we may find ourselves losing the mercy of God in our own lives. And we are told to pray, and do not lead us into temptation. Let me tell you this, God does not tempt anyone to evil, as we are told in James chapter 1, verse 13. James says there, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Why? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. The expression used by Jesus here is a Hebraism. In other words, it is a cultural expression used by the Hebrews, meaning that God is said to do a thing which he only allows to be done. That's just an expression. When God allows something, they say he does it. Doesn't mean that God actually does it. So understand that. Temptation, you see, follows a process. First, there's a simple thought that comes to your mind. Then, a strong impression in the imagination over the thing by which we are then tempted. From there, there goes the delight in viewing that particular thing. Then, finally, consent of the will to do the thing. Or as James put it, then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So, you see, a person may be tempted as we all are at times, but yet not enter into temptation. And we are praying that God will keep us from entering into temptation. Okay? We are asking God to help us in the time of temptation, that we will be given strength to resist and overcome the temptation. And then it concludes but deliver us from the evil one. Help us to recognize the workings of Satan as they affect our lives so that we can consistently live in the will of God. And also, on a larger scale, help us to recognize the workings of Satan in the world around us and ask God's protection and intervention in those situations. And people listening right now, this is critical, this is important, because you don't have to look too far around us to see Satan working almost unopposed in our government, in our culture, in our criminal elements, in people's attitudes, in the denial of, of Christian religion, in all kinds of things. Satan is working, and you need to recognize him. 
And friends, you need to take a personal stand for God, God's righteousness, and against Satan. And do what you can. Pray earnestly, but deliver us from the evil one. And then when as Jesus leads you to do certain things, how you vote, what you say, what you do, follow the Holy Spirit and battle the battle against the force of evil. Then after teaching us to pray according to the pattern he shows us, Jesus gives us the assurance that God hears and answers such prayers. Jesus tells the story of a man who needed bread at an inconvenient time. Now, we are like this man because we need what God only can give. He speaks of the reluctance of his friend to give the bread. But friends, this is not to suggest that God is reluctant to answer our prayers. The point of the story Jesus makes is for us to be persuaded Persistent in prayer to God. Don't give up. Keep praying until the answer is received. And to this story, he teaches God's unalterable promise to hear and answer prayer in verse 9. Jesus says, so I say to you, this is Jesus now, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Jesus gives us the assurance that God always will give what is needed. If it is bread, it will be bread, not something else. If it is fish, it will be fish, not something else. If it is an egg, it will be an egg, not something else. But he emphasizes God's will in answering prayer, goes far beyond the material in verse 13. Jesus says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here is given a picture of the goodness of God and his will for the lives of every person on the face of the earth, including you. God cares for your material needs and the physical environment around you, but far more critical to your life, both in this world and the next to come, is to be born again and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Keep this in mind as you pray to the omnipresent, pure and holy, omniscient Father in heaven. He cares and he answers prayer. So friends, how is your prayer life coming on? Have you really learned to pray? Amen.